beings again in Jesus' name. You know, it seems like a lot of people know that there's something seriously wrong with professed Christianity, with the professed out there being drunks and perverts all over the place, and the church being a culture of iniquity that spread their contagion worldwide into every realm of our entire world. But very few seem to understand why. And they just continue to perpetrate the same message that they preach that is symptomatic of the problem. See, what has happened in the iniquity, in the wickedness of this perverted generation, is symptomatic of the message preached. And that's what I'm going to try to convey to you again, as we do in all the videos, to pull down these strongholds. And the twin strongholds, as I show on my board here, being the twin strongholds with the common denominator. The twin strongholds being inbred sin of sorts. Even if they don't believe in original sin, they preach some kind of corruption of nature or some kind of something that adds inability. So inbred sin and inability, a hindrance of man's free will and self-determination to turn to God and run to God and come clean with him in repentance. See, there's no cleaning or scrubbing, purging happening in repentance, and that's the problem. People are not coming to Jesus Christ for a cleaning, scrubbing, and purging of their sin. They're coming to get covered as royal sons in rags, and that's what they're being given everywhere, not only in the churches. We rail against the churches, and many, many of you know how messed up the churches are in the religious establishment. But not only that, what about all the preachers out here on the streets, in the internet, and all over the blogs that are also offering this same magic cover for sin, the blood's got you covered. See, that's the problem. That's why we have the perverted professed, this culture of immorality running wild in our streets today among professed Christians. You know, the Bible says, he who justifies the wicked and condemns the just, both of them are alike, an abomination to the Lord, in Proverbs 17:15. That's what happens with you folks, because you're so dogged down in your theology, in your substitution, in your magic covers, and everything's covered, that you condemn the just. You condemn those that are living in righteousness and holiness, that say that they have come overcome sin, the flesh, and the devil, that their hearts are pure towards God. You condemn those, and you justify the wicked, those that are living in sin. And not only that, Another thing you do is offer them easy forgiveness. And I'm not saying that God doesn't forgive sin. We see in every instance in the scriptures, if someone comes to Jesus Christ in broken humility, in sincerity of forsaking their past life, seeking a newness and restoration, he had mercy on them. He had mercy upon them because they did their part to their ability, to their strength, to each one given according to his ability came to him in a self-determination and resolve to forsake their past life. But those that keep repeating and repeating again and again, try to pick up where I left off, sin, confess, sin, confess, and by that I mean uh, fornicate, confess, get drunk, confess, watch pornography and confess, over and over again, there's no mercy there. That's, that's exactly what Hebrews is talking about. You sinning willfully against your knowledge of the truth. No sacrifice remain, remains but a fearful expectation of fire and ignition and judgment. And not only that, you have these people that are preaching to them, telling them they sin when they're asked, well, do you sin? Well, they say, well, they have the advocate with the Father. They have 1 John 1, 8 and 9. I can't ever say I don't have sin. Or I'm a liar and there's no truth in me. See, under that lie and deception that they've got to confess they have sin in them, that means if they never have never sinned. Look at it in the original language. It's so simple. If I say I have never sinned in the past, I'm a liar and there's no truth in me. But then you confess and forsake your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive them. 
Not an easy forgiveness to a sin confess, sin confess relationship with God. Unless you think everything you do is sin, but I can't help but wonder when you have these vile sinners coming up to you that are living in pornography and vileness and drunkenness and everything else that you call out vividly on the streets, you street preachers. I can't help but think when you say, well, yeah, I've sinned, that you mean the same exact sins. That you went out and got drunk. You went out and fornicated. I don't know. I'm not getting a false accusation. I'm just coming to a logical conclusion when you say it all the time and then you offer these people some kind of leniency for their ongoing sins when the Scripture doesn't do that. When the Scripture says you've got to come clean with God. In that manner, you're justifying the wicked. I don't care what you think or if you think you're having an impact, if you think you can grab the drunk's hand and the pervert's hand out there and to shed a few tears and pray a little prayer and pat them on the back and send them on their way, that you've done something, then I, what more can I say? But the people never comes out of their sin. They're not clean. They're not pure. We see it all over the place. We see it with the massive addiction to pornography. We see it with the massive prediction addiction to these things among the pastors, among the priests, among the pastors, among the people in the churches. We see it with Christian molestation and incest and abuse of spouses. We see it all over. The statistics blare it out, clarion. But yet you people still take their hand, say a little prayer, and it's in. Where did it happen in the book of Acts? Where in the book of Acts did they tell people that God loves you and has got a wonderful plan for your life, or receive Jesus, or He's going to easily forgive you. And they tell them to flee from this perverse and wicked generation, to repent and to be converted, to have a refreshing of the Spirit, to prove your repentance by your deeds. They preached again, sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. That's what they reasoned with people about. Don't tell me, well, repent means. You don't know what repent means. No, you don't know what repent means. Repentance is a clearing of wrongdoing, a purging of your past life, a pouring out of self before God and coming clean with Him in that clearing and vindication of your past life and then finding mercy at the reconciliation at the mercy seat. There's no such thing as a substitution of Jesus becoming sin, swapping places on the cross. See, that's another thing. You have that in your flawed theology. You listen to these people Jesus paid for your sin. You paid for your sin. Well, isn't that the catchphrase for penal substitution? For a substitution in some manner that takes the place of repentance proven by deeds, in my mind. And that's what I see. Well, here's what we've observed. When we listen to all you preachers out there on the Internet and all you on the blogs, you so-called repentance guys, you go out there, you take the flack, yeah. A lot of it you bring on yourself with your tactics, for sure. But you take the flack, you, you, take, you take the insults and all the rest of it. But nevertheless, here's what we found by listening and watching you in action. We found that, well, you tell everybody you've got to stop sinning. There's no doubt about that. They rail hard against sin. They even come out in vivid detail, like I've said, in some of the tactics and the language that they use is very coarse and vile. And I don't think it's biblical. I don't think that there's any justification in the scriptures. Yes, they call them snakes and vipers. They call them hypocrites in whitewashed tombs. But that's a lot different than coming up to somebody and shouting in their face and trying to provoke them when they're already professed Christians. Rather, you should be pulling down the strongholds that made them a professed Christian hardened in their sin. But you don't do that. So yeah, they all say that you've got to stop sinning to inherit the kingdom. And they describe all the sins in vivid detail. Then they tell them that they've got to repent and trust Jesus because he died for your sins. They don't tell them they've got to repent and produce deeds worthy of repentance. They don't tell them they've got to repent and come clean with God, be scrubbed and purged in a season of godly sorrow, in a process of repentance where they're going to come out on the other side as scrubbed and purged clean, because they don't believe it can happen in repentance, that a person's capable of that. So they tell them exactly the same thing as the church. You've got to stop sinning, but trust in Jesus. 
Trust in faith. Some of them even say faith alone. Trust in all your faith in Jesus alone. Trust in Jesus. Where does it say that in the scriptures? In fact, it says the very opposite, that you're not saved by faith alone, but by working together with God in a faithfulness that produces deeds worthy of repentance and walks in the steps of faith and does the deeds of faith. Those are all in the scriptures. Need I repeat them again? Romans 4.12, uh, James 2.24. Jesus said, if you commit sin, you're a slave to sin. If the sun sets free, is free indeed. Free from what? If you're going to offer them just royal sons in rags, that they enter into Christ with the blood's got them covered, and then he's going to help them sin stop sinning later. It doesn't happen that way. Unless they stop sinning in the process of a broken repentance before God, then it ain't never going to happen. They're going to enter into the church mentality of a sin-confessed thing, and they get hardened against any kind of conviction. They will sear their conscience with a hot iron. I've seen it a hundred times. So yeah, so they tell them they got to repent. But again, back to this argument about the definition of repentance. Well, repentance implies a departure from sin. It implies a conversion, a turning away. It implies a renewing of the self-life. That's why it says, cleanse yourself from all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. That's why it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God. That's why it says those things in combination with repent. Like the, just like the prophets. Amend your ways. Come clean with God. Wash your hands, you sinners. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That is the definition, if you want to say definition, of repentance. Not just purely changing your mind. But no, if you don't incorporate what it means, then people are never going to come to a real repentance. So they offer them then an easy forgiveness in Christ, this trust, receive Jesus. In fact, they'll even have it on their, their, their shirts and their t-shirts when they're out there or holding up signs, trust Jesus. Where does it say that in the scriptures? It says, turn from your sins. He who covers his sins shall not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You have to be empty of guile and deceit. Blessed is the man and in whose heart there is no guile. Guile is treachery and deceit and double-mindedness. So it says, purify your heart, ye double-minded. Back to James 4, I just quoted, 7 through 10. That is what you need to be telling these sinners. You draw near to God and you come clean with God. And you get scrubbed clean in repentance. So you're not a vile sinner. You're not still a homosexual, a lesbian, a porn watcher, a drunkard, or whatever else is out there professed. They already hate your message. Why don't you pull down the strongholds that got them in bondage to their sins? So you won't pull down the strongholds. So they're offered this easy forgiveness. What I mean by that? Well, the blood's got you covered, right? Well, do you sin? Well, it means do you mess up? You say, well, yeah, I sinned the last six months, sure. Again, what am I supposed to assume when you say that? When I keep hearing you say that on your videos, you're out there on the street and you're confronting these people, and they ask you that gotcha question. They think, they think that's the gotcha question. That you're doing the same thing they're doing. You're not talking about a mistake in judgment, that nobody's perfect in knowledge or free from ignorance and prone to mistakes. You're talking about falling into drunkenness and porn and all the rest of it. Those things that disqualify a person from the kingdom. It says if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom. It's not that you've got to continue to do these things. Or that you do them once, it's okay, and then I didn't do it for another two weeks, and then I did it again. No, if you do it once, you're disqualified. See, you were never filled with the Spirit to begin with if you keep doing those things. You see what I'm talking about? That's what I mean by offering them this easy forgiveness. Claiming an advocacy with the Father. Do you think John really means that? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, whose blood is a propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you think he's talking about living in sin and just merely confessing it and picking up where you left off like some of you guys are saying out there? How could he say that when he said, he who sins is of the devil? And practice is not in that verse, okay? In the modern versions, the words paeo, it means to produce or bear or shoot forth. So he who is producing 
sin. He who's growing bad fruit on the bad tree is of the devil. A good tree is not practicing producing good fruit, paeo. It's producing it. It's, it's shooting it forth because it's been cleaned and purged. The axe has been laid to the root in repentance. And now it's been grafted into Christ. In every, every branch in me I purge. Purge, okay? The blood purges you of those things. You're teaching these people to trample the blood. Like that Hebrews 10 scripture talks about, where they trample the Son of God underfoot and count the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified, a common thing. Even though they're not sanctified, that's speaking to real people that were sanctified, that passage. Even though they're not, the same truth still applies here. The blood by which they were sanctified a common thing, insulting the spirit of grace. See, you insult the spirit of grace, you trample the blood, treating it as the blood of animals that cannot take away sin. That has to be applied again and again and again. That's what you think John is saying in 1 John chapter 1 and 2. When he says very clearly that if you're producing bad tr fruit on the bad tree, you are of the devil. Just like Jesus said, he who sins is of the devil. Same thing in John chapter 8 where I'm quoting from there. It's not a matter of practice. It's not a matter of, uh, well, I fell into it this week, but not the following week, and then I fell into it again. And No, you, you're, still, you're still in sin. You've never repented at all. I know you want quick conversions. You want results. You want to seem like you're having an impact because you're taking the flack. So you've convinced yourself that these people are really genuinely getting saved when they prayed a little prayer or shed a couple of tears. Don't you understand the sorrow of the world that worketh death? See, the sorrow of the world that works death is exactly the sorrow you're seeing in these people. Yeah, they're sorry they're drug addicts, drunks, they've ruined their lives, their families. They're in bondage to these horrible, horrible addictions. It's going to take them a, a season of misery and brokenness to come out of that. And you should be there to lend them a hand of assistance to do so. The whole, when the Holy Spirit convicts them of their sin, and they do weep, not just pray some little prayer and pat them on the head and send them on their way with some track. That's not bringing them into the kingdom with all the deceptions out there, with all the pitfalls, with all the phony teachers, and all the nut, nutcases that are on the streets. What chance do they have when they haven't broken free from iniquity? Now, folks, I've seen people broke free from their iniquity, and it took a while for them to do so. But when they did, they are strong, grounded, steadfast, immovable in the faith. And they're a testimony to the worthiness of faithfulness to God and a testimony of the saints of God who perform the righteous acts before the Lord. Not in self-righteousness, but because they love God and faith worketh by love and it purifies the heart of sin and it has victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. It's not filthy rags. It's not the blood's got you covered. It's not substitution and he did it for you and you just trust and receive and confess as, you, as you, your sins occur. No, if you're sinning, you're continually doing those things, then you've never been born again to begin with. You've never entered into Christ because there's no such thing as a magic cover for these sins. And you need to come into a repentance. So that's what we've found. You tell them to repent, stop sinning. You tell them to trust in Jesus alone, as I've described a number of times. Offer them this easy forgiveness for their ongoing sins that you call mess-ups that is inevitably everyone's going to do. And that the virtue of Christ is going to be applied to them and somehow you, that's implied in what you say. And then you admit freely that you do the same thing. So what's the translation of this in my mind? To, in my mind, it's you believe then that grace has got you covered. And that God is very lenient towards sin and towards ongoing sins in his, in his followers. And they're just, he knows they're weak and they're going to mess up inevitably. So he just gives them this magic propitiation and everything's fine and dandy. Every time you mess up, just go ahead and confess and you'll be okay. Don't you realize there's sins unto death and sins not unto death? That there's presumptuous sins and there's sins of ignorance? See, you, you never bring any of that out either. 
See, because you make no distinction between a person that has lacking knowledge or ignorance does something by mistake. And I'm not talking about fornication or getting drunk. That's not by mistake. Those things don't happen by mistake. They happen when you're drawn away by your own lust that you never crucified in repentance and you're taken captive. <clears throat> but that's exactly what I'm talking about here. It's given them a license for their immorality when you think you're preaching hard against sin, telling them they've got to stop sinning, at the same time, this leniency towards sin in the ongoing sin. So as you mess up then, Christ will let it slide because you're trusting in Christ. And he has you all covered, so you just try to do better and better as you go along, and he'll clean you up. He'll change your desires from naughty to nice in sometime along the line. You must believe that by what you preach, by what I hear. And the sins are just easily forgiven by the First John 1, 8, and 9, and, and 2. And these are the sins listed in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, 9, and 10. These are the sins that says, let no one deceive you with empty words. If you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom. You put down promise keepers out there, and those, those heretics for preaching the substitution and the magic cover, who offer nobody any kind of redemption, that don't tell those people that if they keep in that addiction that they won't inherit the kingdom. But yet you do the same thing, in essence, by never talking about purity of heart or a purging in repentance, a clearing of wrongdoing or a mending of the ways. Just taking the drunk's hand, he's crying. Well, I've seen many a drunk crying in the gutters, pulling them out of the gutters, taking them down to detox, have done those things. When we preached on the streets, but they don't come out of that drunkenness because they're not willing. They're not willing to make that resolve and count that cost and strive to enter through that narrow gate. Those are the things you should be telling people, not receive Jesus and confess and trust and just become a royal son in rags for the rest of your life. See, that's what we found. So what's the conclusion? That's what I'm trying to convey to you people that will listen that have an ear to hear, and I know there's some out there that do, that understand this mess. There's a few, very few, but there are some. And most of you, most of you, it's a mess. So you must believe that just as all theology, the twin strongholds of inbred sin and inability with the common denominator of the magic cover of the propitiation that deceives you and bewitches you and enchants you, and that your righteousness is filthy rags and all that kind of thing, you must believe that. That must be part of your theology, that a person cannot stop sinning unless they're saved first and then filled with the Spirit as a filthy vessel. Even though it says you've got to be purged of those things before you're a vessel fit for the Master's use in the Scripture. You must believe that. You also must believe that God's going to clean them up later and change their, you know, take away their lust and their horrible things out of their life, change them from naughty to nice, as they keep saying. Yet it never happens. They keep... They keep repeating and repeating until they fall into utter despair. I know because I get emails from them that fall into this despair and don't know where to turn because you just keep giving them the same excuses. And of course, you must be absolutely convinced you're having an impact on, on these people and against sin. Even though nobody ever stops sinning, even you don't ever stop sinning, even though you fill with the Spirit, you can do all things through Christ, you're willing to take the insults and the, and the slings of people out there but never stop sinning. The blood can never purge you of all sin and iniquity that you can walk in purity and righteousness, holiness all the days of your life. No. So your salvation theology then must be based on some form of substitution, whether it's moral government or penal substitution or whatever you want to call it. Some model that includes a substitutionary payment for sin in some manner and then a cover for sin because of man's inbred inability to come clean with God. See, there's nothing in the scriptures that even slightly suggests that man's unable to do these things. Whenever Jesus demanded you to come clean or to follow or obey, go and sin no more, and all the things he said, it was never anything, well, wait until I, I enable you to do these things. Go and sin no more when I help you go and sin no more. Take up your cross when I help you take up your cross. See, nothing in the scriptures even slightly suggests that. It says, we brought him from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, 
through repentance proven by deeds. Because they're able to produce those deeds in faithfulness to God, in a self-determination of coming to a real repentance. It says a foolish man believes every word, but an astute man comes to repentance. Proving that man is able, through his willing and self-determination, to turn to God. But you know, you convinced him that man is stripped of his free will, stripped of his ability, stripped of everything, and he's just a pile of filthy, stinking rags, so what do you expect? Inevitably, that's what you got, the common denominator of the perverted professed out there. And that's what they are, the perverted professed that are running far and wide across the land. And lastly, <clears throat> none of you that I've found, or any of the other brothers have found that have investigated this for me, I appreciate their hard work. They've never opened to any discussion concerning your tactics or your mindsets or your doctrines. You just condemn. You just get angry. You just write everybody off as heretics because we're having an impact. What are you doing? What are you doing for God? What are you doing? What we're doing is pulling down the strongholds. What we're doing is trying to bring these people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, through a pulling down of the strongholds and bringing them through repentance step by step in that process, no matter how long it takes or how hard it is. And it's, believe me, it's difficult. And it takes a lot of perseverance. So they're not open to anything. <clears throat> so what does all this do? Well, on both ends of the spectrum, in the church, out on the streets, everything we've seen so far, everything, I've not seen any exceptions yet. You can send me links if you like. And show me that there's somebody an exception, but I haven't found any yet, and neither have any of the other brothers that have helped me on this, that they just magnify the false gospel. You won't pull down any of the strongholds that are keeping people in bondage to sin, and you masquerade yourselves as holiness preachers that are standing aloof of the system, but you're offering nothing but the same deceptions as the system in different language, with different tactics, that's all. So you're just masquerading yourself as a bunch of holiness preachers, like Paul Washer does. Masquerades as a holiness preacher while he preaches Calvinism. He believes in the elect. He believes in moral depravity. He believes in man's born a complete moral depraved wretch. Much like the, the so-called reformers of the past. You undo, undermine your own message and make it without purpose because it doesn't bring anybody to redemption. And what's redemption mean? Redemption means release from bondage. Redemption, ransom, same thing. A release from bondage. Bondage of what? Of sin. Of this ruination in their lives that they're in bondage to. And so I always find then the same fundamental errors in the teaching, in the theology. I'm not saying I'm the only one that's right. Self-righteous. We're the only people that see this? No, there are others that do, but they are few and far between. But this is what we've seen. The same fundamental errors in theology that give people their cover for their ongoing sins, a leniency towards, towards their continued iniquity, that they're easily forgiven, say on one hand that the sin must stop, but then it never stops. That's what we see everywhere we look. Those same fundamental errors preached again and again and again that created this culture of immorality and this contagion of sin that has spread into every realm of our society. And it's just getting worse by the minute. Unless we get some preachers out there on the streets, on the blogs, in the YouTube videos to stand up against this iniquity with the scriptures to demand that these people turn from their sins, hold them accountable for their unrighteous deeds to turn from like the prophets did make yourself a new heart turn from all your iniquity before it destroys you and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit like Ezekiel told him why should you die in your sins he goes on to say in that last last verses of chapter 18 why should you die in your sins you make yourself a new heart how Get yourself a new heart, it means, the scriptures. In other words, you obtain, you reach forth, you strive, you go through that process of repentance. Doing your part, 
God will be there to assist with the Holy Spirit. He's already convicted in the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. His hand is outstretched all day long. He's not willing that any should perish. What more do you want him to do? You want him to make these people puppets? To repent for them and to obey for them? But see, that's what your theology is. Many of you. And I can't correct everybody. Only you, through a determined effort of your will, can turn from the, all these false teachings that you've come to conclusion are true in your teaching and you got posted all over your websites. All I can do is keep warning you. And this is what we've observed. We got a perverted professed running wild in the streets and the churches all over our country, all over the world, in fact. And it's symptomatic of what's being preached to them worldwide. And unless that changes drastically, I don't see anything else going to change.